In the harsh, wintry cold of the north, a land of hard men and tree worshippers, one dynasty stands out. A house of wealth and trade, of cunning and corpulence, of knighthood and southern faith. How did the mermen of the Manda almost seize power over the kingdom of the Reach? Why were they forced into exile? What schemes are they hatching in a song of ice and fire? And who's this fat guy? For more animated lore videos, hit the like and subscribe buttons, and comment your favourite Mandalay down below. I've also got a cheeky Patreon if you're interested. This is the history of House Mandalay. The House of Mandalay are an ancient family of first men from the Reach who served the powerful Gardener Kings. The Mandalays ruled from the castle of Dunstanbury by the Manda, the longest river in Westeros. Though they once worshipped the old gods, the culture of the Reach transformed when the Gardeners accepted Andals into the kingdom, and House Mandalay eventually converted to the Faith of the Seven. For reasons unbeknownst to most maesters, the Mermen of the Manda had a vicious feud with the Peaks of Starpike. This grew so intense that King Gwain III, known as Gwain the Fat, persuaded the Houses to accept his judgement on their rivalry, and do fealty for their lands without bloodshed. Not all kings were so wise. Garth X, crowned at the age of seven, surrounded himself with lickspittles and power mongers. As his beard turned grey and his wits slipped away, two factions formed around him. You see, Garth Greybeard had failed to sire a son, and a succession crisis loomed. One of his daughters married into House Manderley, the other, oh, there's a shock, House Peak. The true heir of the Oaken Seat is a fact lost to time, but it certainly didn't matter to these feuding factions. The tension grew and grew, as plots bred conspiracy, conspiracy bred betrayal, and betrayal bred murder, until the Reach erupted into open war, and its lordly houses clung onto their chosen champions. There was nothing the senile king could do. The Storm King and the King of the Rock carved out land for themselves during the chaos. One Dornish king crossed the River Manda and sacked Highgarden itself, desecrating the Oaken Seat, murdering the Greybeard, and putting the castle to the torch. Nearly ten years of anarchy followed, until a golden rose blossomed. Sir Ormond Tyrell, the High Steward of Highgarden, united the Reach Lords against the Mandalays and the Peaks, and placed Garth Greybeard's second cousin on the throne. King Mern VI, who rebuilt Highgarden and restored the power of the Reach. Anarchy had reigned, yet the bitter rivalry had not yet reached its, uh, peak. The great lords of Dunsonbury grew greater still, but we are told that, in their insatiable thirst for power, they overreached, exposing their soft underbelly to foes and rivals. King Percy and the Third Gardener grew fearful of the Merman Banner, and conspired with Lord Lorimar Peak to drive the Mandalays into exile. Or perhaps it was Lord Peak who persuaded the king. Regardless, the Peaks eagerly snatched the castle of Dunstanbury, adding it to their sigil. The Reachmen fled to the Kingdom of the North, bending the knee to House Stark of Winterfell, swearing a fierce oath of loyalty. The Stark King granted their wealthy new bannermen the castle of Wolf's Den, which stood sentinel by the White Knife River. The Mandalays built a settlement around the Wolf's Den, which over the centuries became White Harbour the only port city in the north, and a valuable means by which the exiled lords sustained their wealth. As the wolf's den cracked and crumbled, a new castle was built, one that mirrored their long-lost Dunstanbury, the new castle. I wonder where Gurm gets all his ideas from. The saga of their exile may have occurred as long as a thousand years before Aegon's conquest, yet the Mandalays retained their worship of the Seven and acceptance of knighthood, and more importantly perhaps, their undying gratitude to the wolves of Winterfell. When Aegon Targaryen invaded the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, King Torren Stark bent the knee. Not all were so swift. The Three Sisters of the Vale renounced their boy King, Ronald Arryn, and Lady Marla Sunderland was crowned Queen by the island's rebellious lords. Lord Paramount Torren Stark was tasked with ending this rebellion, so he sent a knight of House Manderley named Sir Warwick to command the Northern Army. The Sisterman's rebellion soon ended without bloodshed. Queen Marla was exiled, her brother Stefan became the new Lord of the Sisters, and his son was taken to White Harbour as a hostage. The Mandalays had proven their loyalty to the Targaryens. Half a century later, Jaehaerys I sat the Iron Throne. During a royal progress, good Queen Alysanne visited White Harbour and its Lord, Theomor Mandalay. Lord Theomor was a gracious host. He threw a large feast, offered his daughter Jessamine to be the Queen's cupbearer, and allowed Alysanne to host the North's first ever women's council in his castle. This must have placed him in her good favour, for she later organised a betrothal between the widowed Theomor and her daughter, the beautiful, if vain, Princess Viserra Targaryen. Alas, she died while drunkenly riding through the streets of King's Landing, but the Manderley grind did not stop there. Theomor's great-grandson, Lord Desmond, saw an opportunity to right this wrong. This may contain future House of the Dragon spoilers, so skip to the next chapter if you want. On his journey to Winterfell, Prince Jaceris Valarian first arrived at White Harbour. 
another marriage pact was sealed. Lord Desmond's youngest daughter would marry Prince Joffrey Velaryon. Once the war was won, of course. When Queen Rhaenyra captured King's Landing, Desmond sent his sons to aid her. The fearsome Sir Medric and the clever Sir Torren. Fear, paranoia, and hunger led to mass riots throughout the city, and the brothers led their men to restore order. The brothers Manderley later fled the capital with Rhaenyra, sailing to White Harbour while she left for Dragonstone. When the Dance of the Dragons was over, King Aegon III sat the Iron Throne, although he was just a child. So Torren Manderley returned to King's Landing and was named one of Aegon's seven regents. When the winter fever broke out in the sisters and spread to White Harbour, Lord Desmond caught the fever and died. His son Sir Medric succeeded him as Lord, but died of the same illness just four days later. He had sired no children, so Torren resigned as regent and returned to White Harbour as its new lord. But the northerner kept his chubby fingers in many southron political pies. The ancient rivalry reared its ugly head when the new hand, Lord Unwin Peak, tried to betroth his daughter to Aegon. Lord Torren sent a letter to the king, urging him to marry his daughter. After all, both Targamandli marriage pacts had collapsed in the past, so it was only fair. Aegon did not accept, but that wasn't the end of Torren's ambition. After Unwin resigned, a great council was called, and Lord Manderley was named the new Hand of the King. He never truly liked young Aegon, and the feeling was mutual, but the large lord proved to be an able administrator, enacting major tax reforms and judging the trials of those who plotted to poison the king. In anticipation of Aegon's 16th name day, Torren prepared a grand royal progress. It was not to be. The king strode into the council chambers, cancelled the progress, and removed Torren as his hand. Torren returned to White Harbour in bitter humiliation, taking with him the court fool, Mushroom. We will probably discover what the slighted lord got up to in Fire and Blood Part 2, uh, if that ever comes out. By the start of the main book series, we know of six Mandalays. The Lord of White Harbour is a corpulent and cunning Wyman Mandalay, Lord Lamprey, Lord Lard, Lord too fat to sit a horse. At the end of Robert's Rebellion, he had fought at the Battle of the Trident and was saved by his retainer, Sir Bartimus, who was made Castellan of Wolf's Den, which now had become the White Harbour prison. The widowed Wyman sired two sons, the quiet Sir Willis and the boisterous Sir Wendell. The former sired two daughters, Winifred and Wyler, while the latter is childless. Wait, a fat Lord Manderley with two sons, both of them knights, one childless? This sounds kind of familiar, George. Anyway, Wymond has at least two cousins, Lady Donella, who married Lord Hallis Hornwood, and Sir Marlon, the commander of the Newcastle garrison. When Rob Stark calls the banners, Wendell and Willis join him. Sir Wendell accompanies Rob's contingent riding for Riverrun as one of his personal guard, while Sir Willis commands the Manderley forces within Roos Bolton's army marching south. Sir Willis is captured by the Lannisters during the Battle of the Green Fork, and Lord Hallis Hornwood, the husband of his father's cousin, is slain. That's relevant, stay with me. Sir Wendell survives the Battle of the Whispering Wood, but Lord Hornwood's only legitimate son, Darren, is slain. No, seriously, this is actually relevant. You'll see why. Up north, Winterfell hosts a harvest feast. Lord Wyman informs Bran Stark that he's willing to mint new coins for King Rob, and proposes to build a fleet of galleys. As well as ingratiating himself with the Starks, he eyes an opportunity to expand his lands and holdings. You see, with Hallis and Darren dead, the male line of House Hornwood is extinct. The widowed Lady Donella now rules Hornwood, so Lord Wyman offers to marry his cousin. She rejects him, but upon leaving the feast, is kidnapped by Ramsay Snow, the bastard of Bolton, who forcibly marries her and locks her away in a tower, where she starves to death. Ramsay declares himself the new Lord of Hornwood. Wyman sends his men to seize the Hornwood lands and drive out the Boltons. In the south, the captured Willis is taken to Harrenhal as a prisoner, but he's freed when it falls to Roose Bolton and the Brave Companions. He and his brother Wendell are both invited to attend the wedding between Edmure Tully and Roslyn Frey at the Twins. Unfortunately, Sir Willis is ambushed by Sir Gregor Clegane and his men, and he's once again imprisoned in Harrenhal. The starving knight is fed a roast goat by the mountain. Unbeknownst to him, he's actually eating the cooked flesh of Vargo Hoat, leader of the Brave Companions. Yet, this is a better fate than his brother could hope for. Sir Wendell makes it to the Red Wedding unscathed, but is slain during the massacre with a crossbow bolt to the face. With Willis hostage, Wyman can offer little resistance. Three Freys arrive to deliver Wendell's bones and negotiate marriage alliances. Rhaegar offers to wed Winifred and betroth Wyler to Little Walder Frey, while Sir Jared spins a mocking tale of Rob Stark turning into a wolf and slaughtering Sir Wendell. All the while, Simmond bribes several members of the White Harbour Court, even sending his wife's handmaid to seduce Manderley's fool. Not even the Newcastle Maester can be trusted. After all, Maester Theomore was once a Lannister of Lannisport. Foes and false friends surround him, infesting his city like cockroaches. 
Davo Seaworth arrives at White Harbor to negotiate with Wyman on behalf of King Stannis Baratheon. To secure his son's release, Wyman has Davos arrested, thrown into the wolf's den, and executed. Or does he? Robb Stark may be dead, but the vengeful, cunning Lord Wyman does not go gentle into that good knight. He has played the role of a broken man, just as his granddaughter Winifred has played the role of a happy bride-to-be. They have no intentions of upholding the marriage, nor executing poor Davos. A lookalike from the dungeons is beheaded in his place, confirming his pretend loyalty to the Lannisters. And Sir Jaime orders Wyllys to be released from Harrenhal and sent back home. Wyman tells Davos that he will support Stannis Baratheon if the Onion Knight travels to Skagos to rescue Rickon Stark. He knows of Rickon's location from Wex Pike, the young ironborn bastard who survived Ramsay's sacking of Winterfell. Wyman and the three Freys travel to Winterfell to witness a wedding between Ramsay Bolton and, ahem, <clears throat> Arya Stark, aka Jane Poole. The three Freys go missing in the snow, that's a shame. No worries though, Wyman's made up for it with three giant pork pies- wait a second. Tensions flare as the Northern Lords are trapped in Winterfell by the blizzard. When Little Walder Frey is found dead in the snow, his uncle Sir Hostine accuses Wyman and slashes one of his many chins. Through the power of sheer neck blubber, Lord Manderley survives, but Roose has had enough. He orders the Frey and Manderley troops to march outside Winterfell and take the fight directly to Stannis, whose army is stationed at a nearby Crofter's village. What is to come for House Manderley in the winds of winter? The Manderley forces are sure to betray the phrase, and Bolton's days are numbered. If Wymond is killed by Roose Bolton, or perhaps even Stannis, the Lordship passes to his quiet son, Willis. Or perhaps he'll survive, and support the one true king once Davos brings Rickon Stark back to Winterfell. Or maybe Wyman was lying. He doesn't want Rickon to be Lord of Winterfell at all, but the new King of the North. Regardless of the outcome, Lord Wyman will find a way to avenge his son and strike back against the phrase. How these upjumped weasels became so powerful in the first place can be discovered in this video. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed this house history, and check out my Patreon if you want more goodies, including the Patreon Discord and an animated history of House Dane. Quinn the GM also has a great video about House Peak on his channel, so check that out as well. See you next time.